Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third session of our electrophysiology, um, a third, fifth session of a electrophysiology training workshop. Um, today's topic is going to be uh, machine learning one. And um, we're going to talk about a uh, number of different concepts like uh, what's the idea behind machine learning, what's the purpose, what's the difference between AI machine learning and deep learning, then different categories for um, uh, learning methodologies, different feature types, and uh, in the end, um, a number of uh, pitfalls and um, yeah, how to work with machine learning and next week we'll have a number of machine learning algorithms and we'll look into um, how to apply those on actual data. So let's start with the original idea and purpose of machine learning. And uh, machine learning is part of um, artificial intelligence, kind of. And when thinking about artificial intelligence, um, usually everybody has, uh, has these, uh, something like these robots uh, from iRobot in mind, which act totally uh, um, autonomously, find a solution to whatever task is thrown at them, and behave pretty human-like in the end. But uh, what we usually see when, um, um, yeah, when um, applying mach um, yeah, artificial intelligence to solve problems. Um, what they usually end up with is some kind of narrow AI, and narrow AI is more like um, the artificial intelligence you play against than playing chess on your smartphone or what you see in a factory or something the like. And uh, nowadays, there's a lot of different application cases for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. In particular, for example, you have those in factories, you have those uh, you have, uh, self driving cars which try to learn uh, how to navigate their way along this, uh, the roads. You have pl uh, f um, different systems and planes uh, which are augmented by artificial intelligence. You have artificial intelligence, of course, in uh, video games. Uh, you have smart devices like your, uh, like for example, a smart fridge which keeps track of how much food is still inside. And you have uh, even machine learning and uh, stocks and finance trying to predict the rise or fall of some specific uh, stocks informing you on what to buy. Yeah. And I thought it might be a good idea to just uh, start with. Um, yeah, therefore the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning. And the bro uh, broad grand group is artificial intelligence, where everything basically belongs into. And within artifi um, artificial intelligence, we have machine learning. And within that, we have deep learning. And that basically works out as follows. If we, for example, have Steve here on the uh, left side of that image, and we extract some data from Steve, because we want to know uh, some kind of health information on Steve. Uh, we teach the computer how to interpret that information. Let's say you um, recorded blood pressure from Steve and now you taught the computer if blood pressure is too low or too high, that would basically indicate that Steve is either healthy or not healthy. That already goes in the direction of um, artificial intelligence because you just taught the computer to mimic some human behavior at this point. And then you can theoretically augment that with uh, machine learning. And the difference here is that, again, we uh, extract information from uh, Steve. Uh, but this time, we don't literally tell the computer step by step what it has to learn, um, like what information it has to is extract from the information we provided it with. It has to um, learn on its own what, kind, uh, what pieces of information are important whether there's, let's say, a sequence between that information, whether um, some of that information is totally not relevant at all. In any way, with machine learning, the computer is supposed to um, understand that. Um, and usually, yeah, you want to do that if you have um, 
if, if you yourself are not really sure about what kind of information may be uh, important to teach the machine that in the most efficient way. And um, a nice example of that is um, if you, for example, had an EEG from a patient and that had uh, 256 channels. Not all of those channels are going to be important on whether the patient is healthy or not, but in advance, usually you don't know which channels are going to be important, which channels are not going to be important. You may have some idea that, let's say, look for the temp uh, temporal area, let's look for the motor area or whatever, but you're not 100% sure. So you basically give this really high dimensional information to the machine in hopes that uh, if you throw enough information at the machine, it basically uh, finds itself a pattern within that information, extracts the pattern, and then uses this information to determine whether Steve is healthy or not. And then uh, we have deep learning, which goes one step further. With deep learning, we don't manually extract that information here anymore, which could have been, let's say, power in different EG channels or connectivity across channels. With deep learning, um, the algorithm is supposed to basically only be fed raw data and extract itself from that raw data what may be important and also then learn from that self-learned uh, features which of those self-learned features are going to be important later on for the classification. And the usual application case of that is um, providing an algorithm, an algorithm, machine learning algorithm with um, speech information like an audio signal or with video information that you captured from a camera and those have the nice um, kind of uh, habit that those signals have a temporal component which can be leveraged across some of those um, learning uh, methods and they have a spatial component like um, if you look at your camera signal um, the stuff on the top left is likely more likely connected with the stuff in, uh, in the top middle than on the bottom right and you uh, if you applied that now, if you applied a neuronal network to uh, your image stream, you would basically leverage this uh, higher concept knowledge of the information you're providing the system with, which makes translating deep learning algorithms rather difficult to um, stuff like um, EEG or MAC data since um, we still have some kind of, let's say, spatial or temporal relationship, but it's uh, usually um, more... Uh, complex to uh, actually extract information from that than from uh, imaging like video streams to yeah, detect humans within. Okay, so having covered the difference between AI, machine learning and deep learning, the next uh, topic is basically going to be the different learning types uh, you could choose when applying some machine learning. Let's say we have some data set here and we want to apply unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning um, is going to take your data, the white dots here, and then it's going to um, put two classes, for example, onto that. Either you're going to have to define the number of classes or you're going to have to define the minimum distance between classes to f have to provide it with either of those informations. And then it basically says whether the points are more likely to belong to the red group or the blue group. And that basically shifts around over a couple of iterations. And unsupervised learning is by that, uh, in that way, basically trying to find a way how to separate data you provided it with, uh, it with in a more, in a really natural way that's unique to the, uh, just convenient to the data. It, it goes for the separation that is most convenient within your data. And the other, um, the other option you usually can choose from is having your data and then applying some supervised learning. And while you uh, provided the um, unsupervised learning only with uh, the features you were looking at, the supervised learning you also provide with the labels of the classes that these uh, dots actually correspond to. And as you can see here, a natural separation between those two groups would have been the left side and the right side, which is convenient, which is the most convenient separation you can have from that within your data. But what uh, for example, uh, in this example, we would actually have been interested in a separation between the top and the bottom, which would then mean that this ideal separation unsupervising derived here is, 
it's just not the most convenient separation that we uh, not the most con um, yeah the separation we want is not the most convenient separation. Therefore, unsupervised learning derived a different um, solution here. And with supervised learning, you're trying to um, by providing this label information, you're trying to fit those two classes indicated by the um, bubbles here onto your data, and you're trying to uh, basically have a profound um, um, as profound as possible uh, differentiation between those two classes while keeping your classes themselves as cohesive as possible. And um, yeah, and then we have a third kind of learning, which usually you wouldn't apply for classification tasks, and that's uh, reinforcement learning. With reinforcement learning, you uh, you do uh, usually different stuff. Your reinforcement learning starts at a specific state, and then it iteratively tries to find um, states which are more uh, convenient, which are of higher value than the uh, current state. And a gamified explanation of that would be having a, a person in a labyrinth uh, trying to find the exit, and then by taking uh, one step at a time, the algorithm is evaluating that it basically got closer to the exit, Worked, uh, walked for, uh, further away. In general, whether the actual position is better or worse than the last one, and it tries to predict ex its next step based on the steps it has already taken. And while this may not be super convenient if you want to uh, classify between, let's say, responders and non-responders, or you want to classify between um, healthy and affected people. You can use that, for example, if you want to um, optimize treatment to a patient. Um, a nice example would be if you had a um, Parkinson's patient getting some deep brain stimulation, and that usually gets uh, configured if the arm of the patient is moved. And if the rigidity vanishes due to the stimulation, the stimulation parameters are considered effective. So what the um examiner basically does is set the stimulation to a more or less random configuration move the arm and evaluate whether this uh, configuration was uh, good or bad and then he repeats that process iteratively until he arrives at a good um, configuration and that's actually the thing that's reinforcement in reinforcement learning doing but it's yeah doing the th uh, that on its own it's iteratively improving the system given uh, given to the algorithm until it arrives at this uh, point that's the local optimum. Okay, and then we have a number of different um, cl um, classification types, techniques. Um, when you want to separate your data, you usually have to choose whether applying a linear classifier or applying a Nonlinear classifier, and we're going to talk a lot more about that later on. But in brief, the linear classifier is basically, as indicated here, always trying to find some kind of linear separation across the feature space you provided it with. It does not necessarily has have to uh, doesn't necessarily has to leverage all dimensions you uh, on like all features you provided the algorithm with, but it's always going for a straight line. Whereas the nonlinear algorithm doesn't uh, have to go for a straight line. The tr uh, kind of advantage of those linear approaches is that in nine out of ten times they still fit pretty good with uh, nonlinear data, because uh, the um, mistakes are usually in a very narrow margin. Whereas with nonlinear approaches you on the one hand usually need way more data to uh, train your more complicated uh, model to the uh, pattern you want to detect and on the other hand you ideally have an idea of what kind of not uh, a linear shape your data has to have in the first place and if you already have that information you could have linearized your data and going back to the faster linear approach so can do non uh, nonlinear stuff, but uh, you you need to be uh, you need to have more information on the data on your hand, and it's going to take more data to train the algorithm usually. 
uh, which brings us to the next step, which is going to be how to train those machine learning algorithms. And what you usually want to do is, regardless of the specific training method that you um, that you are going to choose, which we are going to discuss in a couple of minutes, what you usually want to do is you separate your data set into a, a number of different smaller data sets. Then you isolate one of those data sets and then you train your machine learning algorithm on the remaining, in this case, eight. And, um, then reading the literature on that, usually it's recommended to have like a 80-20 split or a 90-10 split, meaning that the smaller quantities, usually the data set you later on use to verify the quality of your, uh, how well your ac um, classifier actually performed. The idea is that if you train your cl um, classifier on these um, eight uh, subsets, uh, the information comprom compromise of all these eight subsets, and then you evaluate it on the ninth uh, data subset you previously isolated from the data, you're not going to have the issue that um, the da uh, that uh, your machine learning algorithm is already highly optimized to the data you put into it, Therefore, um, you um, make it um, basically um, a little uh, optimistic estimate of the actual performance. So, what you always, uh, as I said, what you always want to do is split your data into a training set and a evaluation data set. Train the classifier on the training data set, and then evaluate it on the evaluation data set. And after doing that, you basically have to circle around. And what you want to do is you want to have, if you do that, let's say, in, um, spl a split like here into nine different segments, you, wa um, you want to have um, e uh, nine different cycles. And in those nine different cycles, you want each se uh, separate block to at least once play the role of the evaluation data set. So you're actually um, sure you're not evaluating against a specific outlier or you're trained against a specific outlier in your data set. Yeah, and then I have uh, the first question of this session. There it is. Okay. Um, so, what happens if you do not split your data into the training and the evaluation set? Um, as I already s uh, kind of indicated, if you don't split it into a training and an evaluation data set, it's quite likely that the actual performance of your classifier is going to be overestimated. The reason being is, let's say you have n um, nine patients, and you want what you actually want to know is how does my classifier uh, perform if I added a 10th patient or an 11th or a 12th patient. And to kind of simulate that behavior, you tr uh, chop off 8 patients, use those 8 patients as training, and then evaluate on the 9th patient. And then you can actually see if I get data that's from a genuinely new patient, how does the algorithm perform. And uh, the other thing is, uh, your results may not be generalizable if you choose, uh, if you don't basically uh, 
ma uh, split your data into a training and an evaluation data set. And um, that also depends on how you split your data. If you, for example, would have um, 10 samples, again, you have nine patients, and then you s simply split off 10% of your data as an evaluation data set, then you're just asking the algorithm, how does my data, um, uh, um, you're asking the algorithm, uh, how does my algorithm perform if I give it new data, but very likely from patients it already knows. So it's quite important um, for you to decide where you actually want to make that split. If you uh, split off one patient, you're asking how does the algorithm perform if I add in a new patient. If you s make the split somewhere else, you're basically asking uh, another question in terms of generalizability. Okay. Then the next thing is uh, overfitting and underfitting. If you have a data set, you, um, um, you uh, train your machine learning algorithm on that. It may happen that the data is either underfitted, which is the left here, or overfitted, which is the right here. Underfitting basically means that you could have extracted more information from the data and um, overfitting is the opposite. That means you extracted really much information from the data and both of them come with the drawbacks. Underfitting, rather obvious, give the algorithm a couple of more cycles, it's going to extract more information from your data, it's going to uh, derive a better uh, separation between your classes and uh, you're going to profit more from that in the end. Overfitting, on the other hand, is going to be a little more tricky to understand. With, um, let's say the blue dot here is the actual distribution of the blue data samples you collected, and the red uh, blob is the uh, red orange blob is the actual distribution of the orange blobs you sampled. And as you can see, we have this uh, one orange outlier here, and that basically made this area into an per that se uh, overfitted separation line into an orange area. Whereas actually, ideally, that would have been uh, the blue area. Then we have the next question. So what's the drawback from overfitting? Well, as the first point says already, uh, your data may not be uh, applicable to generally new data. And the reason for that being is um, if you overfitted your data, that area here actually should have been blue, but we had that outlier. So if we add more data points, it's more likely for here to uh, be, uh, uh, for this area to basically be populated by blue points than by orange points. Hence, we actually learn something incorrect. Um, then, of course, if we do overfitting, we, g we get really complex patterns and shapes almost uh, snaking through the data. And the last uh, is kind of a red herring. You want to be very difficult about interpreting uh, uh, feature selection and separation line across your, um, from your cl uh, classification but that's going to be a topic like a little later on. So the next step is going to be feature selection. We already know that whatever machine learning algorithm we selected for the problem at hand, whether we went with uh, supervised or unsupervised learning and um, 
where we showed training uh, train it uh, using some um, yeah, um, training and um, evaluation data sets so uh, the next question that would naturally pop up is how we are going to select those features and the different a couple of different methods let's say those uh, blocks here indicate the different features that are available to us and the green uh, blocks are the features that we se uh, selected the most simple approach is that we would apply some brute force approach which would basically just be selecting a, ra a random couple of features and then and trying another pattern and trying another pattern until you eventually find a pattern which looks good to you and that works really well if you have like really no dimens uh, dimensionality across your feature space but if the dimensionally uh, dimensionality starts exceeding really no uh, low numbers like 10 or 11 you're going to run into real issues with that kind of approach because the number of potential combinations you're going to have to evaluate is going to be astronomical therefore there's also different methods uh, one of them would be a forward feature selection. With forward feature selection you basically start with an empty bag and you evaluate each single feature on its own. And then you select the one feature which performed best. And then you run the thing again. And this time you're gonna select the feature which performed best during the uh, last run. But in addition you're gonna pair it with uh, each uh, feature, uh, each remaining feature. So you're basically testing couples of two this time. And then you're repeating the process, testing couple, uh, couples of threes. And um, you're basically um, doing that, going on, going on, until your classification accuracy doesn't increase any further through the um, additional selection of um, additional features. And then, of course, the opposite approach. You start with all features. And then you start removing features one by one until you arrive at uh, basically a space which has the, um, a really nice classification accuracy. Or whatever you're going to go for. And then there's also uh, other methods. Uh, with the previous methods like forward feature selection and backward feature selection, you're going to run into the issue that um, you're converging towards uh, uh, local um, optimum, meaning that um, if you rerun the uh, algorithm with different starting positions um, or different uh, slightly different uh, data sets, you uh, might uh, derive different uh, results because you are converged to another uh, local minimum or maxima. And um, to kind of uh, counteract this approach, there's uh, other methods like, um, um, for example, um, trying uh, multiple different starting positions and then converging, uh, yeah, tr evaluating them all at the same time and se selecting in the end the best one. Or you could go for something uh, like this here, which is um, a kind of a copycat from genetics. They start with a random s uh, selection and then uh, they change some of uh, those features but not all of them and then uh, it is um, investigated on whether the performance decreased or increased and respective to how that performed you're uh, gonna inform your next uh, feature selection so if that was a good choice you're gonna keep most of them if that was a bad choice you may not keep many of them and going forward and with that approach you're kind of adding in some uh, random element and through uh, adding that random element, there's the hope that that kind of uh, washes out that, uh, well not washes out, that uh, this uh, diminishes your chances of um, converging towards l um, a bad local minimum or maxima because you're yeah, randomizing behind the scenes. So you have a couple of different uh, feature select me uh, l um, selection methods you can go with. And then you have the next question.
Okay, and s I guess somebody misclicked. The answer is no. You're uh, not going to converge to the same uh, solution. Um, next up, it's going to be hyperparameter tuning. And um, when applying your machine learning algorithm, um, wh what we got now covered is uh, how to sel select the right learning type, how to train it, how to uh, like um, chop your data accordingly to train the algorithm in a nice way. And um, the next step would be how to train the hyperparameters of your algorithm. Usually, it's not only about selecting those features, it's also about s some of those algorithms have hyperparameters. For example, if you did uh, k-nearest neighbor, which um, determines classification on based on how many uh, neighbors within this, uh, yeah, how many neighbors are of uh, the, uh, what what's the most like uh, common class within the neighborhood. And for uh, to basically uh, derive a conclusion here, each point has to know uh, how many points does my neighborhood consist of, or how may I, uh, how uh, what's the distance my neighborhood consists of. And that's c usually called a hyperparameter, and those have to be um, adapted. And changing those is going to have a pretty s uh, significant impact on your classification results. And again, when tuning those hyperparameters, you uh, like with uh, feature selection, you do a, a cross-validation, which is separating your data into the uh, training data set and the evaluation data set. But this time, you basically make the separation twice. So you have an inner loop and you have an outer loop. Within the inner loop, you would um, do your uh, feature selection, and hence always have one uh, evaluation uh, data set and a couple of training data sets. And after that completed, across all of its iterations, you have the outer loop. And the outer loop is going to um, evaluate the opt like that optimized feature selection uh, that got optimized on uh, in this case uh, eight data points eight, eight uh, yes uh, segments of the data not eight data points eight segments of the data against the uh, the ninth which is new to evaluate the hyperparameter and uh, in terms of uh, that if you like have to tune those hyperparameters um, as I said you have to apply that second cross validation. Because, uh, like with the feature selection, you want to tune your hyperparameters more or less um, independently of the specific characteristics of your data set. Meaning, um, you want your, for the same reasons that you want your feature uh, selection to be robust towards new patients and the like, you want your hyperparameter configuration to be robust towards uh, new patients. And that's the same logic behind that in the end. So. If we do that uh, cross-validation and we don't want to do hyperparameter tuning, what's the minimum number of cross-validation loops we have to have, basically? So um, at the very least, you want to have two, because you're going to need, um, as I said, you're going to need an inner loop for uh, the optimization of the feature selection. And then you're going to need an outer loop to optimize those hyperparameters. So yeah, you're going to end up with two loops at the very least, if you want to have both the feature selection and the um, hyperparameter uh, optimization somewhat robust towards let's say new patients or yeah whatever you wherever you want to make that split
and then we have like almost uh, the last topic for today which is going to be uh, classifier quality metrics and that's basically determining how you uh, yeah, want to qualify how well your classifier is uh, performing um, let's say we have some real positive data points we have some real negative data points we have some uh, data points that we evaluated as positive and we have some data points that we evaluated as negative and from those four com uh, different pieces of information, we can derive a plethora of different uh, metrics to evaluate our classifier. What we can do, for example, is we can uh, evaluate the precision, which is going to be uh, the real positive values that also got uh, indicated as uh, positive by our classifier, divided by um, all data points that got... Um, evaluated positive. So you're basically uh, punishing the, cl uh, the classifier for um, um, estimating that um, specific data points are positive, although they should have been negative. It's kind of a punishment it receives if it does in uh, stuff incorrectly. Whereas you could also go for recall, which is similar, but this time instead of punishing the algorithm for uh, um, false uh, positives. We are go um, yeah, we're gonna uh, punish it for uh, false negatives because uh, we have uh, this error here yeah, on the downside of the uh, fraction. And then, for example, we could go with accuracy. Accuracy is basically how many uh, correct estimates did I have among all estimates made. And then there's another of different me uh, metrics that you could go for, and they could become exceedingly more complicated. And um, in the end, what you always should ask yourself is, uh, what do you want to achieve with the algorithm you are just training? Do you want it to be an algorithm which has a high, or machine learning uh, uh, model which has a high accuracy? Do you want it to be a model which has a high precision or a high, high recall? Because very likely, as with the statistical stuff, you're gonna end up with a, um, you're gonna have to optimize your model towards one of those metrics. You're not gonna be able to optimize it towards all those metrics at once. So, to highlight that a little, I have an example here. Um, let's say you did a machine learning algorithm to detect. Um, COVID and you want to know how well the system is performed. So would you either go with precision, uh, recall or accuracy? I'm just going to go back one slide and then you can see what those metrics actually were. And uh, what you want to go with, actually, ag again, it really depends on uh, what kind of uh, strategy you want to employ. With, uh, that uh, COVID detection algorithm, it's likely you want to have a good recall because you really want to avoid uh, not detecting uh, positive patients because that's likely of more harm than erroneously uh, detecting uh, patients as positive that are um, negative because worst case patient is uh, patient isolates at home uh, although he wouldn't have to whereas uh, with the other one um, a patient not isolating at home which would should have isolated it's going to be a significant impact here and then yeah as I said it really depends on uh, in which direction you want to take the thing and uh, the f um, yeah, 
final topic for today is going to be a number of uh, pitfalls you uh, should strive to avoid when basically doing uh, anything machine learning. And uh, one of them is uh, when evaluating your classifier performance. Um, you should always strive to do some kind of cross-validation approach because um, if you detect that, uh, if for example, if we go back to the COVID example and we can say that um, we throw all data in, we trained it on all data and then we evaluated it on the very same data and now we know that it detects 100% of our patients. That's great, but uh, with that you literally would not have a clue on how the system would perform if you provided it, uh, it with data from a new patient. So you should always go for something like the cross-validation approach uh, when evaluating classifier performance. Then interpreting feature selection. Inter uh, interpreting feature selection is a minefield. Generally, you want to stay af as fast as uh, uh, possible away from that. Something y that's something you don't want to do. Interpreting feature uh, selection is going to be super dependent on um, how were well features distributed, what kind of learning algorithm did you use, how did you tune the hyper uh, parameters of your algorithm. Um, how did you uh, in, um, initialize it? It's it's a minefield. You usually don't want to do that. And the uh, cardinal sin would basically be that um, let's say you did forward feature selection. Um, you added three features to your data set. Your classification accuracy is somewhat uh, midi core, and then y you add uh, another feature, and it skyrockets. The worst possible conclusion you could draw from that is basically that this feature seems to be a defining feature between those two classes, which is absurdly uh, like super wrong because you already added three features. So the importance of that feature in this case would at the very least depend on the f those three features you already added to your data set. So it's, it's not like the thing is important on its own. It's uh, d um, dependent, like a, uh, basically like a dip uh, dependent probability of the importance of this feature. And then again, it's dependent on uh, the hyperparameters of the classifier, how the data were dis distributed, it's going to uh, end really badly if you're going to try doing that. Then uh, the performance of linear and nonlinear classifiers. Uh, when dealing with a, uh, a problem and you want to apply machine learning to that, 9 out of 10 times, go for the linear classifier. It's not going to perform significantly worse than the nonlinear classifier. With a nonlinear classifier, you're going to have to know way more about your data. Y it's going to be may, uh, way more susceptible to uh, um, um, irregularities within your data. And with the nonlinear approaches, you really want to be sure uh, you know what you're doing. Whereas those linear approaches are way more robust usually. Um, then if you train your classifier and you found um, an um, optimal feature set, you found optimal hyperparameters, you always got to be aware of the fact that qu it's quite likely you didn't find the global ma uh, optimum in terms of your uh, search for uh, ideal feature and um, hyperparameter combinations. It's quite likely you just discovered a locally optimal solution. and. But that, that's not really something you should have, uh, should be like uh, super concerned about. If your op uh, locally optimal solution derives, um, let's say, yeah, you went for classification uh, classification accuracy and you derive a classification accuracy of ninety nine percent with your locally optimal solution, uh, there's no point in searching for the global maximum. Just go with the local one. But you sh always should keep in mind that there might be a better combination. A bigger fish out there. Um, and then the solution that your machine learning algorithm derives are always super dependent on the, uh, the properties of the samples you uh, fed into the those algorithms. If you have, um, if you for example split it into your training and your evaluation data set and you uh, of course you're going to uh, iterate through them let's say with one of those splits you're unlucky and uh, one of those evaluation data sets has a lot of outliers Th that's gonna severely impact your uh, like this one uh, 
uh, cl uh, classific uh, the accuracy of this one uh, this uh, cl uh, uh, yeah individual training cycle so uh, that's uh, also one reason why you want to do the uh, cross validation uh, thing separating into uh, training and uh, non training data sets and um, iterating over them the al your algorithm and your solutions are always super dependent on the properties of the concre the concrete properties of the training and data set at hand S and by basically uh, cross validating over them and uh, mixing them a little you're trying to take that um, random element out of there a little then if you split your data you should always be uh, very careful on where and how you want to split that data in the first place if you just split off 10 percent of your data because you do that 90 percent 10 percent split which literally like 99 percent of the literature on the topic says you're only gonna test how you um, algorithm is gonna um, perform if you feed it with 10% new data. You're not gonna test how it performs if you add in a new patient or if you had uh, different patient groups like um, for example uh, responders and uh, non-responders and you um, for the evaluation data set you split off different uh, non-responders from your data set and uh, evaluated it against that, you would have no clue, uh, clue if, uh, how your system would react if you add a new non-responder to your data set. So you always got to keep in mind for those uh, splits to uh, be meaningful in context to uh, the um, tasks you're trying to teach that machine learning algorithm. And then um, that goes a little in the direction of interpreting the feature selection um, which, as I already said, is, is kind of a minefield. Um, even if, uh, let's say, you only had uh, add one feature to your machine learning algorithm, it all immediately performs great. That does not necessarily have to mean that this one feature is like the def uh, defining uh, thing, or the ground truth uh, sp uh, for a difference between those two groups. It could be that it's uh, just. Um, camouflaging another factor beneath it which just let's say correlates with that factor you were looking into or whatever so you've got to be a little wary of that and then the last topic, uh, last, topic last idea is uh, improper cost functions then optimizing your machine learning algorithm um, as we've seen there's a number of different metrics, metrics you can use to um, evaluate the performance of that and if you use accuracy for the optimization, you're going to end up with a um, machine learning algorithm which is going to have a pretty good accuracy in the end. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it uh, performs pretty good in terms of recall, for example. For that to be pretty good, you would have to uh, optimize it in terms of recall, which then in uh, again would might cost uh, diminishing uh, accuracy. So. When selecting that stuff, you always have to keep in mind what are you, what is the thing you actually want from that uh, machine learning algorithm you're training in the first place, and how would you want to uh, yeah, teach it that. That's it for today's session. Next topic is going to be machine learning too, where we're going to have a number of different machine learning algorithms, and we basically just going to go through uh, how those different uh, methods work, um, how they. Um, learn from uh, data being provided and um, yeah what uh, kind of uh, features what kind of uh, data they are optimally, optimally ideally used to separate and thanks for your attention mm. let me know if you have any questions <laughs>